Hebrews 4, we'll take our reading uh, from verse 1. We'll just read down to the, uh, to the end of the chapter. Uh, it's been a little while since we've looked at Hebrews, so it's good for us to uh, revise that whole, whole chapter. Hebrews 4, from verse 1, says, Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labour therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's pray and ask the Lord to guide us as we uh, study his word today. Father, we thank you for this time that we have. Uh, just to briefly look into your word, uh, we thank you so much that we have this privilege uh, this opportunity to uh, to come to this place to worship, um, to open your word in our own language, uh, Lord, without fear of persecution, without fear for, for our lives, Lord, we are just so grateful for the freedom that we enjoy uh, in this place. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to take full advantage of that freedom now as we uh, study your word, help us to be focused upon it. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be able to work in our hearts, uh, Lord, that there would be no uh, hindrance to his ministry, uh, teaching and illuminating uh, our minds. And Lord, I pray that uh, all of us would, um, uh, Lord, that, that word would, uh, would be profitable to, to each one here today. Father, we thank you once again. Uh, bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be looking at the last uh, three verses of Hebrews chapter 4. And this section of Hebrews from uh, verse 14 in, in chapter 4 uh, all the way to uh, chapter 10 is really about the superiority of the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's the beginning of this, this new section uh, in Hebrews. Now we had a glimpse of this doctrine, uh, that's the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We had a glimpse of this way back in chapter 2, verse 17. Uh, and uh, we, we didn't really touch on it in a lot of detail. It says, uh, Wherefore in all things it be behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So this concept of Jesus as our high priest was introduced back then. But now we're going to really be looking at it uh, in a lot of depth from, from here in the next few chapters. In chapter 1 of Hebrews, the author emphasises the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw that uh, he is superior to the angels because he is the Son of God. 
He is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. He is unchanging, he is unchangeable, and his throne is eternal. In chapter 2, the emphasis is on the, humi- uh, on the humanity of, of Jesus. He took on himself human form, okay, not the other way around. He took on himself humanity. Uh, in 2.16, he writes that Jesus took on himself the seed of Abraham. He took on human form so that he could suffer and die for our sins. And now in chapter 4, the author is introducing the doc- this doctrine that we're looking at of the high priesthood of Christ. Now perhaps uh, we have some trouble uh, really understanding this doctrine because we don't have uh, priests uh, today in our church. Uh, some of you may have come from uh, a Roman Catholic background, so you might perhaps understand this better. Uh, the, the Roman Catholic priests function in a similar way to, the, to what the Old Testament priests uh, function in the Old Testament. In the Roman Catholic system, the priest administers the sacraments to the people. Uh, the grace of God comes via the Mass, uh, via marriage and, and so forth which can only be given by an ordained priest. And uh, by their own doctrinal statements, the Catholic priest is a mediator between God and the people. That's that's something that they themselves teach, that the priest uh, is a mediator between God and the people. And the Reformation mostly corrected this unbiblical error although some Reformed churches still have a priest of sorts. Uh, But the biblical teaching that the Reformers emphasised was that there is only one mediator between God and man. We find this in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5, a verse we know uh, all too well, don't we? For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So the, the Bible teaches that we don't need a priest to be a mediator between God and man, uh, we can come straight to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our mediator. Furthermore, the Bible teaches that all believers are in fact priests. We are a kingdom of priests under Christ, the great high priest. In Revelation 1.6 we see that God, it says, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So Christ has made us kings and priests before God. I heard it said that the, uh, and I can't remember who it was that said this, uh, perhaps I read it in a book somewhere, but that I heard it said that the Reformation did not abolish the priesthood, but it abolished the laity. I, I really like that because there is now no more distinction between uh, clergy and layperson. Okay. In, in biblical Christianity, there is no distinction, as in Roman Catholicism, uh, because before God, there is no such thing as a lay person. We are all priests. All of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are all priests. That means we can come directly to God for grace. Uh, we do not need another person, another human being to be our mediator we can come directly to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our great high priest. Now, in in light of all this, especially of of all the doctrine that we find in the first four chapters of Hebrews, uh, we are commanded to hold fast to our profession. So Hebrews uh, 4.14 says, uh, Seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. This teaching that Jesus is our great high priest really summarises the doctrines of his deity and humanity, as well as his current role as mediator and advocate for us. And and we've seen this in in, uh, the previous chapters of Hebrews. We've seen that the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, one, is our our great high priest. Uh, Secondly, he, he is our mediator. He's also our advocate. And uh, because of all this, uh, we should be willing to grab hold of what we believe about him and we should be willing to make it transform our life. 
And that's what the word, uh, that's what this command here, let us hold fast our profession means. The word hold fast means to tenaciously cling to uh, without letting it slip away. Uh, we've all seen Christians who were once strong in the faith but have now uh, slipped away. And that's what's in view here. That, that can happen to us as well if we do not realise uh, what the great high priesthood of Christ means. Now, the, the doctrines that we've uh, spoken of so far and that we've just touched on briefly uh, today, they're, they're all very basic and it's good for us to rehearse them. Because if we fail to, to, to understand them, if we fail to remember them, that's when we can let go of our faith. Uh, these basic doctrines are good for us to, to remember that the Lord Jesus Christ is our great high priest. And so we come to the next point. Uh, Jesus Christ, our sympathetic high priest. Verse 15 says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And as we come to, this, uh, to verse 15, we see the word for, which means that there is a reason for what was previously said. The reason why we can hold fast to our profession is that we have a sympathetic high priest. The author of Hebrews acknowledges that it is a difficult thing to tenaciously cling to our Christian identity, our faith, while in the middle of a trial. Okay, he's not saying it's an easy thing to do. He's saying th this is a very hard thing to do. That's why he, he commands it. And, and I guess if you want to make a picture in your mind, it, it's, it's of a person who is you know, in the middle of rushing waters, threatening to drown him, turbulent waters. And the only hope of staying alive is to tenaciously cling to a rope held by a rescuer. With all his strength, he must hold on until he is, re he is rescued. And that's the kind of picture that we're seeing here, holding fast to our profession. Uh, this is not talking about um, the possibility of losing our salvation. That's not what's in view here. We know that that is not biblical. Uh, once we are saved, uh, we are always saved. But our Christian faith, our, our, our Christian life, uh, our daily walk with God, that's what we can lose if we fail to hold on to our profession. And in verse 15, the author uses a double negative for emphasis. He says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched. It's there for emphasis, and uh, the author also may have been addressing doubt in their minds as to the character of Christ. In times of trial, we tend to doubt the compassion of God or, or anyone else for that matter. Uh, we can have a woe is me attitude. Um, when I was uh, just looking at, at this verse and, and thinking and meditating on, on this, uh, this attitude that we can have sometimes in life, uh, you know, that, that song came to my head, you know, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Have you ever been like that? Where you, you think that nobody understands what you're going through. Not even your spouse, your, your husband or your wife. Uh, your best friends, um, nobody understands. And, and we can be like that. That's, an, uh, that's something that I think we can all understand. Um, there's a version of that song uh, that I like. It says, uh, nobody knows the troubles I've seen, nobody knows but Jesus. Uh, I do like that version of that song. I think that makes a lot of sense, especially in light of what we're seeing here. And really, this is what we're what we're looking at here. Nobody knows except for the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody knows how we feel uh, at, our, at our worst point in life except for the Lord. Sometimes we, uh, we think that nobody understands what we're going through but of course uh, he does. And this is an important aspect of the incarnation of Christ that we often overlook. He took on human form so that he could suffer and be tempted as a man. That's one of the reasons why the Lord Jesus Christ took on flesh. So that he could suffer okay, as God uh, in heaven, as the creator of the universe, 
uh, those things were, were, were not were not available to him. He, he could not experience the suffering and the, and the temptation that we experience on a daily basis. Now this goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, that the prophecy that uh, was made to Adam and Eve, the seed of the woman, the Lord Jesus Christ, would, would crush the serpent's head. He would defeat Satan at the cross, but in doing so, his heel would be bruised. That can only happen, that, that bruising of that heel, that prophecy back in Genesis, could only happen because the Lord Jesus Christ took on humanity. And in reading through the Gospel account, we see that Jesus grew up. Uh, he went through the learning process just like, uh, just like our kids do. We've got lots of kids here. Um, uh, it, it, it's hard to grow up and to have to go to school. Um, they'd much rather be uh, you know, watching... Uh, some silly show on, on, on TV, I'm sure, or playing, or, or doing something fun, but they have to learn, don't they? That's part of their experience as growing up. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ had to do exactly the same thing. He had to sit in, well, not in a church, but in, in the temple or uh, in a synagogue and, and learn, just like we did. He had to go to school, and then he had to learn the trade of Joseph. He had to become a carpenter. Uh, so so that, that, there's all these things in life that, that he went through. He suffered uh, hunger, just like we do. Uh, he was exposed to the elements. He was you know, cold or, or, or very hot. Uh, he was physically and emotionally exhausted. We see that in the Gospel account various times. So he, he went through all those things. And then, of course, at the end, he, he suffered unbelievable physical pain during the crucifixion. Okay. And, and I can safely say that none of us here will ever have to suffer like the Lord Jesus Christ suffered. Okay. Uh, the, the, the pain and the anguish, the suffering that he went through, really has, has, has no has no comparison in the human experience. Okay? He suffered it fully uh, as, as a human being. And there is nothing that we will go through that will even come close to that. And so, he not only knows our pain in theory, but he knows and understands our suffering because he went through it himself. It's not theoretical, it's practical because he is willing to help us through it. He also understands our trials and temptations because he was tempted in all points. We have this reminder in Hebrews 4.15. It says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He understands what, if, what it's like to be tempted. There is no area of life which Jesus was not tested and came through victorious. Now it stands to reason that Jesus was tempted throughout all his life. Uh, we see that, uh, that time, of course, in, uh, when he was tempted by Satan in the desert. Uh, but it, it does stand to reason that he was tempted throughout all his life. But, of course, those temptations were, were very easy for him to overcome. Okay? He had no sin nature. So he was able to overcome them very, very, very quickly and very easily. However, the temptations that he had to face uh, in the desert when, uh, when Satan himself tempted him were on another level. Okay? They're not things that we're going to ever face in life. Okay? The devil's not going to come and tempt us like that, ever. Okay? We have enough trouble with the everyday temptations, don't we? He faced the ultimate temptation in the wilderness. Something, again, that no human has ever faced or will ever face again. Uh, and, and if you, you're into sports, uh, you can think of it that, that that was the world championship of temptation. Okay, the, the fate of the universe was at stake. Up until then, uh, Jesus had you know, really destroyed all of Satan's elite tempters. And now he faces the arch tempter, the devil himself. And in convincing fashion, Jesus effortlessly dismantles Satan's attack and comes through victorious. Uh, we see that in, that in that episode when Jesus was tempted in the desert. He, 
he quickly and easily defeats Satan's temptations just by quoting scripture. And this proves to everyone, especially to Satan, that Jesus as fully man and fully God is perfectly sinless. He is without sin. And as our great high priest, sympathetic to our suffering and yet perfectly sinless, Jesus is able to help us through the trial because of that. And that's something that we need to understand as well. We need to be reminded of this, don't we? When we go through our, our everyday temptations, uh, whatever it is that we're going through, uh, we're tempted to, to do this and, and we all have our certain weaknesses, don't we? Uh, we all have our points where we're most vulnerable to temptation. We should remember that the Lord Jesus Christ overcame all that. And so we can come to him for help. He is our great high priest. Um, and, and although he, was, uh, he never succumbed to temptation, he, he does know what it feels like. And so we can come to him. And so we come to the third point, the throne of grace. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Verse 16. Here we have one of the great verses in this epistle. It is an invitation to come to the place where we find the solution to our predicament. Firstly, we are to come boldly, it says. Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace. Uh, this word does not mean to come arrogantly, uh, but with frankness, uh, bluntness, assurance, confidence. Uh, we are to come freely, openly and plainly to the throne of grace. Uh, when we come before God, in prayer, we ought not to try to pretend that we are better than we actually are. Our words are not to be adorned with fanciful language or false pretense. Uh, when we pray, it should be from our hearts. Uh, expressing what we actually think and feel. Uh, and most of us here uh, who you know, grew up in a Christian church, uh, we, we were not taught to recite prayers by rote as some uh, Christians do. And I'm thankful for that. Because uh, in, in, in just expressing how our hearts are feeling, we can come boldly and simply tell God in our own words what is in our heart of hearts. And that's what, that's what this verse means. We are to come boldly, just, just very simply expressing to God uh, what we are feeling at this time. I love the story of, um, that the Lord Jesus Christ told of the Pharisee and the publican. If you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. We have this, this, uh, this story that Jesus told. And uh, th there's lots of things we can learn from this, but Luke chapter 18 <coughs> shows us this contrast in the way we come to the throne of grace. Luke 18 verses 9 to 14 says, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised other, others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. We have uh, these two people here praying. And the contrast couldn't be greater. The uh, Pharisee who has uh, you know, these swelling words, uh, uh, seemingly beautiful prayer designed to in impress others, and to lift himself up. But it does not, his, his, his prayers do not reach the throne of grace, do they? Uh, however, the publican in his short prayer uh, is, is to the point. 
uh, in this very simple simple prayer that the publican utters, you know, he doesn't even lift up his eyes, he's in a very um, contrite state, even physically, uh, he says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. But in that short prayer, he effectively secures God's grace. Uh, the Lord Jesus says that this man went down to his house justified rather than the Pharisee. Uh, he, th this publican, he came boldly to the throne of grace. Uh, he didn't come before men, but he came before God. Uh, his sincere prayer, short on words, but of immeasurable truth, hits the bullseye. Uh, this, uh, going back to Hebrews chapter 4, this, this throne of grace, uh, what a wonderful phrase for us to meditate on. The throne indicates Christ's position as sovereign and that we ought to fear him, and yet grace is found there at the throne. Grace is found at the throne. Grace, of course, is unmerited favour before God. Unmerited means that we, we do not deserve the grace of God. It's not through our, our own goodness uh, or because uh, you know, we have not sinned in a while that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. No. It's simply by His grace that we come to the throne. Uh, sometimes we, uh, you know, we, we, we don't want to come boldly to the throne because uh, we do not feel like we, we deserve to. Uh, because uh, perhaps we, we've done something wrong on that day or, or recently. And so we, we don't come to the throne of grace. Well, brethren, isn't that the time where, where we most uh, need to? Yeah. Uh, we can come, uh, it, sorry, it, it is not through our own goodness, but simply by His grace. So do not wait until you feel spiritual to come to the throne of grace. But come when, when you are not worthy. Uh, because it's only there at the throne that we find that grace. And, and the rest of this verse, verse 16, the rest of it shows uh, the order of our coming to the throne. It says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Uh, and here's the order. That we may obtain mercy, first of all. First we obtain mercy, which means that we find forgiveness for our sins. Um, the translation here uh, does not mean that maybe we'll obtain mercy and maybe we won't. Uh, the translation there is, is of, a, of a purpose clause, that we may obtain mercy. The purpose of our coming to the throne of grace is to obtain mercy. This is our confession of sin, which we ought to do first as we come to the throne. Uh, one commentator says, mercy refers to the remission and removal of past sins, grace to the bestowal of spiritual gifts. And we often skip this vital step in our prayer life, don't we? We, we go straight to God and uh, we ask God for what we want, don't we? Uh, when we're praying. We just, God, give me this and, and I, I really need this and I really want this without stopping to ask for the forgiveness that we don't so desperately need. And, and when we do that, brethren, when we, when we neglect this step in coming to the throne of grace, uh, we tend to ask for the wrong thing in prayer and then we wonder why God doesn't answer our prayers. But when we spend the time to confess our sins, we can then think clearly to ask God for the things that we actually need. And what we actually need all the time is grace. We come to the throne of grace to find grace to help in time of need. And grace and mercy are closely related here. By asking for mercy, uh, that is asking God to forgive our sins, we admit that we are not deserving of any favour from God. So it makes sense, doesn't it? We can only receive the grace of God when we have this attitude, when we ask God for help in time of need, knowing we, that we do not deserve His help at all. The word help is uh, from the same root word uh, sucker that we found in Hebrews uh, 2.18. Uh, if you've got your Bibles handy, turn 
back to Hebrews 2.18, it says, uh, and a very similar thought here as to what we've just read in these few verses, it says in Hebrews 2.18, For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. The word help in verse 16 that we says uh, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help is the same word uh, found there as well. Um, it means urgent help. Okay, and, and, and what is in view here is a cry of distress from the believer to God. The Hebrew Christians to whom this letter was written were suffering and were on the edge of falling away from Christ. Uh, the author is urging them to hold fast to their faith, to focus on the great high priest, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, who because of his sinless victory over temptation is able to help them if they cry out to him. And we ought to be doing the same thing. When was the last time that we came boldly to the throne of grace? Uh, when have you confidently and plainly shared your heart with the Lord? Uh, as, the, as the Lord's return draws near, uh, we need this more than ever. Uh, as we're faced with a society and a culture that denies God, uh, brethren, we need to come boldly to the throne of grace. Uh, we see uh, Christians falling away from the faith. Uh, we see you know, churches falling apart. And brethren, uh, we're not immune from that. Uh, if we do not take heed to these words, the same thing will happen to us. So as we go our separate ways this week, you know, we're going to our homes, our workplaces, our, our neighbourhoods. Uh, let us make this our, our, our focus, that we, we come boldly to the throne of grace. That we come with the right attitude and that we obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you for uh, this time that we've had uh, this morning. Uh, we know that it's been very brief and, and just a very, uh, very quick look at, at these, uh, these wonderful verses that we have before us. Lord, help us to be meditating upon them. I pray that your Holy Spirit would impress them upon our hearts uh, as we go out uh, this week. Lord, I pray that you'd help us, um, Lord, to, to every moment to to come before you, Father, um, when we're alone, uh, when we're in times of distress and trouble, uh, to, to remember that the Lord Jesus Christ understands our suffering. Uh, Lord, help us in, in, in those moments to come boldly to the throne of grace. And Lord, we acknowledge that we don't do this often enough, uh, so Lord, we need your help in this. Uh, remind us, we pray. And Lord, bless uh, each and every one of my brothers and sisters in Christ here today. Lord, help us to go out and, and to, be, uh, uh, to, to proclaim the, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to those around us. Lord, to, uh, to be uh, mindful of our witness before others. Lord, help us to uh, always be uh, looking for those opportunities to share Christ with the lost. Father, we, we thank you and pray that you'd look after us and, and be with us uh, this coming week. In Jesus' name, Amen.